Hello again. I'm Paul Beckwith and uh, you know as I look outside we're under a snowstorm almost no visibility and uh, you know huge huge snowflakes it's almost like lake effect uh, snow in Ottawa you know it's not possible but uh, you know massive massive uh, huge snowflakes you can tell a lot about um, different um, weather patterns and you know the physics of weather and stuff from actually the size of the uh, snowflakes um, but anyway, I'm in last video I talked about how amazingly the Arctic Ocean was covered by shelf ice and completely filled to the bottom with fresh water. And this occurred at two different periods lasting thousands of years from 60 to 70,000 years ago and also from 130 to 150,000 years ago. And this is an extremely important finding for explaining abrupt climate changes in the past. Fortunately, that mechanism doesn't exist today because we're in a much warmer climate, right? The, the mechanism um, for the, the times when the Arctic Ocean was completely fresh water were in the deepest, um, coldest uh, glacial periods. Um, and I explained the mechanisms in the last video. So now I'm going to talk about some of the other connections to the Arctic. And soon in a video, I'll discuss the peer-reviewed scientific, scientific paper talking about how they know it was only fresh water. Basically the thorium, um, the thorium found in the seafloor sediments. Okay, so I talked about this. Uh, make sure you watch the last video. Um, if you if you haven't done so at this stage, now this is uh, I'm going to talk about a, some a number of uh, other effects here before I get into the the actual papers. The climate change rapidly alongside sea ice decline in the north. Okay, we're getting rapid sea ice decline now, so we're trying to figure out you know what that's going to lead to, and understand it more. But we had when. When we had previous periods of rapid sea ice decline, it changed the, cl the climate rapidly. Okay, so this was a study that showed abrupt climate change occurs as a result of widespread decrease of sea ice. Okay, there's a long running debate on the mechanisms causing abrupt climate change during the glacial period. It basically shows you that the cause of the swiftness and extent of sudden climate change must be found in the oceans. Okay, so during the last glacial period, 10,000 to 110,000 years ago, the northern hemisphere was covered in glacial ice and extensive sea ice covering the Nordic seas. The cold glacial climate was interrupted by periods of very fast warm up of up to 16 and a half degrees Celsius over the Greenland ice sheet in a matter of a decade or two, and then the cooling back down took hundreds to thousands of years. These are the so-called Dansgaard osher events, or DO events, DO oscillations. These rapid glacial climate fluctuations were discovered in Greenland ice core drillings decades ago, but the cause has been hotly contested. And we need to really understand this stuff because the rate of warming today is, is exceeds that of the warming in the Dansgaard Osher event. So, and it, so these studies, the results show that the rapid warmings in are related to quick and extensive decline in sea ice cover in the Nordic seas. Okay, so our up until now most extensive and detailed reconstruction of sea ice documents the importance of the rapid decrease of sea ice cover and the connected feedback mechanism causing abrupt climate change. So if you use sediment core data and ice core data, you can figure out what, what's going on, and that's what they did. You can match the dates, link all of the cores in both seafloor uh, sediment cores and the glacial cores in Greenland. They have, you know, volcanoes would pop off. It would deposit ash or tephra. And you can see these dark layers both in the ice and in the sediments, and then you can match them or you can match one core to another core by those very easy. And then you know the dates in between. Okay, so, so basically the sea ice changes in the past show how climate change today can be 
abruptly. So, you know, extensive decline of sea ice, and then it changes the ocean circulation. And I talked about the specific cases 60 to 70,000 years ago and 130 to 150,000 years ago when the entire Arctic uh, ocean became salt water. So sea ice is huge. It's, it's not just a result of climate change, but it changes, it feeds back and changes the climate. So sea ice can play the pacemaker role in abrupt climate change. Okay, so this was a study in the Norwegian Sea looking at shrinkage and growth of ice um, and, uh, you know, looking at periods of between 32 and 40,000 years ago. Sea ice, the growth or shrinkage of sea ice is often viewed as a symptom of climate change, but new research shows it, play, it may have played a more causative role in abrupt climate changes thousands of years ago. Okay, so this was a study that looked at changes in sea ice, in, and this is part of the Dansgaard Oshkar climate event. The temperature shifts, it says of up to 15, but it's up to 16.5, as I mentioned from the previous, previous uh, paper. And, you know, uh, yeah, so this is talking about a specific study. Then, sea ice changes in the Norwegian Sea were an integral part of oceanic and atmospheric processes because once these things change, these lead to abrupt glacial climate changes in Greenland and then over large parts of the world. Okay, so, so that's an interesting paper. And then the Arctic sea ice loss is linked to abrupt climate change events. Of course, this is very relevant today, the hugely rapid loss of Arctic sea ice. So this is another study that looked at the period 30 to 100,000 years ago. And they talked again about Greenland temperatures rising, rising as much as 16 or, well, it was 16 and a half degrees. So this is, this is another study. Um, you know, for years, scientists have been puzzled about the correlation between Arctic sea ice loss and the extreme climate events found in the ice core record. There's been at least four theories, but now we can say that sea ice is critical. So it's all down to sea ice, sea ice, sea ice. Now, the summertime sea ice in the Arctic has experienced a 40% decline in the last few decades. Two thirds of that reduction at least is caused by human induced climate change. So what's gonna happen next? Okay, so we studied the past to find out what's gonna happen next. Salt concentrations in the ice cores could unveil Dansgaard Osher events. So this is another Finding you you get um, salt spray you get salt in the air and then it's transported and deposits on the on the uh, on on the surface of Greenland and then it gets caught up in the ice and you can measure the actual salt concentration in the ice cores and you can get signals that relate to the Dansgaard Oshkar Osh events okay so sea sea salt concentrations in the ice is very easy to to measure and then if you have the transport models of how it gets there it can tell you about what the ocean is doing because the amount of um, sea salt in the air will depend on the temperature of the water and how much water is exposed and also on the strength of the winds. Abrupt climate change events from the past can help predict the ones ahead. So Dansgaard Osher, understanding that, it can help us uh, look at future risks of the of the changes because temperature changes now are greater than any period in the past, including the Dansgaard Osher jumps in temperature. Okay, so this is another paper on that. And rapid Arctic warming has in the past shifted the Southern Ocean winds. Okay, so we're talking about the Arctic, but there's global implications. So believe it or not, when the Arctic rapidly warms or rapidly cools, there's huge changes in the southern, there's changes in the intertropical convergence zone where the rain bands are, and there's changes in the strength of the winds and the location of the southern, uh, the jet stream in the southern hemisphere as well. The global climate is a complex machine in which some pieces are separate, yet others are connected. So finding the connections is important to predict what's going to happen now in the future, in the near term and, and further out future. Okay, a dramatic pattern in our planet's climate history involves paroxysms in Arctic temperatures, huge swings, right? The fierce winds circulate, circling Antarctic uh, southern annular mode winds, jet stream winds, 
are an important lever on the global climate. And they respond very, very quickly in response to northern hemisphere temperature spikes. It takes the oceans longer to respond, but these really abrupt changes in the northern hemisphere make it quickly to the southern hemisphere in the winds. The atmospheric circulation is tightly connected across the globe. It changed, okay, so they looked at a two mile long West Antarctic ice core was examined and then the layers allowed you to find the temperature from the oxygen isotopes. And we could look at the signal in Antarctica when we had the DO events in the Arctic. And when, this, when the Antarctic ice cores show that the Southern Ocean winds shifted at the same time or at most within a few decades of each rapid Greenland warming event. Antarctic ice temperatures, air temperatures rather, on the other hand, are connected through the slower moving oceans and took about two centuries to respond. So when we get the very, very rapid warming, eight to 10 degrees or 16 degrees over Greenland, almost immediately or within a few decades, we get huge shifts in the Southern Ocean wind strength and that changes the jet streams in the Southern Ocean. It shows the whole interconnections. We've never found anything in the ice cores before that show the Southern Hemisphere responding so quickly to what happened in the Northern Hemisphere. What we found is that when it warms up abruptly in the Northern Hemisphere, the winds in the Southern Hemisphere move northward and they blow over warmer water. And the opposite happens when the Northern Hemisphere cools. Also the tropical rain bands and the Northern Hemisphere jet stream adjust. We know that they adjust to the temperature balance between hemispheres but we didn't know about the winds in the Southern Hemisphere responding so quickly. We knew there were changes. Okay, so there's ice cores, ice core data. Okay, there's a general understanding in the climate science community that global warming is not just about temperature change, it's about changing winds, changing jet streams, changing weather patterns. Uneven warming shifts the equatorial rain band, the mid-latitude westerlies. Okay, one expected consequence of global climate change is the hemispheres will not heat evenly. Okay, the location of the intertropical convergence zone shifts. We know it shifts with the seasons. Okay, but it turns out that it also shifts with, um, with warming. Um, through a series of modeling studies, the authors find that a warming of the mid-latitude northern hemisphere drives the ITCZ and the southern hemispheric westerly jet northward. And the mechanism is, as the ITCZ intertropical convergence zone moves north, following the warming, the Hadley cell in the southern hemisphere gets stronger. This causes the subtropical jet to grow in strength. So the, the, the and, and uh, you know, we get the whole, so the whole planet is affected. Now also ozone depletion is, is affecting the jet stream shifts in the Southern Hemisphere. And that dominates the greenhouse gas effect in the Southern Hemisphere. So the ozone hole, uh, it, it affects things. So there's a whole study on that, which I'm not gonna go into detail, but this is a, this is a very key uh, finding here. And there's a paper on this. Record high Arctic fresh water will flow to the Labrador Sea affecting local and global oceans and climate. So. Right now we're getting large increases of fresh water in the Arctic and this is some of the pathways of how it gets through. Lots of it goes through the Canadian archipelago. We thought more of it went through this side here, but actually it turns out that most of it goes through the Canadian archipelago into the Labrador Sea and then further down. So this is a simulated red dye tracer showing that. Fresh water is accumulating in the Arctic Ocean. The Beaufort Sea, which is the largest Arctic Ocean freshwater reservoir today, has increased its freshwater content by 40% over the last two decades. How and where this water will flow into the Arctic Ocean is important for local and global conditions. Okay, so there's a new, this new study shows <coughs> that the freshwater travels through the Canadian archipelago to reach the Labrador Sea rather than through the wider marine passageways that connect the seas in Northern Europe. Okay, the Canadian archipelago is a major conduit between the Arctic and North Atlantic. So this is a new finding. So as the winds, you know, winds in the Beaufort Gyre weaken, then the fresh water is not confined so much and it can, can go south. 
Okay, very key paper. Thanks for listening.